Okay, in this uh, in this video, we're going to take a uh, well, well, just just a bit of review here. We um, we've been developing these expressions which describe the anomalies over. So far, we've done this for the uh, very equidimensionally shaped object. This is for the horizontal cylinder, which is extending in and out of the uh, in and out of the screen here. And uh, when we do this, we come up with diagnostic positions. The um, analytical form of the vertical component of the anomaly is um, usually falls out in two terms. We've got the uh, term which describes the maximum value of the anomaly here, directly over the um, on a point on the surface directly over the center of the, the uh, cylinder in this case. And then we also have a shape term which describes this symmetrical looking uh, bell shaped curve. And we were able to you know, derive diagnostic uh, positions, uh, depth index multipliers and, and so on uh, you know, using, this, using this shape term here. And uh, these are the uh, uh, values of x over z at uh, points along the curve where, you know, in this case, for example, uh, uh, the maximum is about 0.42, and it drops off to you know one half at about 100 meters here. So we know that the cylinder uh, at one half uh, x is equal to z. So <clears throat> so that was an easy one. Uh, but we could do that for any of these positions and come up with uh, a variety of estimates of z and take the average. They all should be the same. Uh, they usually aren't because of measurement errors, even with a what we would consider to be a pure signal, no noise. Uh, you and I are going to measure this off at uh, three quarters, two thirds, one half, and so on. And we're going to come up with uh, different estimates of different estimates of z. <clears throat> so we also did this for the sphere and. Uh, so we've talked a good bit about um, simple geometrical objects. We, you know, we did talk about the vertical cylinder and also the infinite plate um, as a, you know geometries that we could use in order to 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 approximate the influence of geological features of interest. Now, so here we have two anomalies. Um, one is associated with a buried equidimensionally shaped object. Uh, the other is associated with a horizontal cylinder. So we have two anomalies, one's produced by a sphere, one's produced by a horizontal cylinder. Can you tell which is which? So how would you do this? You know, think about that for a moment. <clears throat> so <clears throat> having put some thought into that, uh, basically it would be a fairly systematic process. You would determine the diagnostic positions for each anomaly and uh, you know maybe you pick um, uh, pick three or four diagnostic positions in order to estimate Z uh, but you'd make estimates of Z using uh, depth index multipliers for the cylinder the horizontal cylinder and the sphere and the object which produces the least dispersion in the estimates of Z the smallest range or the smallest standard deviation. Uh, that would be the object that you would go with. So, so we'd be looking at these two anomalies. We'd be um, <clears throat> assuming that they were both a sphere and a horizontal cylinder. And then we'd calculate the depth, assuming that this anomaly was both a sphere and a horizontal cylinder. And we'd see which assumption gave us the most compact, uh, least variability in the estimate of z and then that would be the uh, that would be the object that that uh, we would uh, would conclude is most likely producing the anomaly that we see here so so I'd suggest you know go uh, take a screen capture and uh, you know, take a shot at this you could limit your analysis to three diagnostic positions three quarters one half uh, one third <clears throat> You know, as you do this, there are a couple assumptions that um, and adjustments that that you need to make. We we've, we've still made it easy for you because we've put the zero milligal line in there, and so zero is zero. Uh, 
And remember, in you know, working with real data, these anomalies could be superimposed upon some background regional uh, regional anomaly we talked about. You know, separation of the of the residual. Uh, another assumption that you do have to compensate for here is that for this anomaly, we have to realize that the zero reference point, the location of the peak is at 25 meters. For this one, we did it like we usually have done. We put the peak as the peak of the anomaly is located at zero, and we have negative distances on one side, positive distances on the other. This is not the way it's going to be in real data. Um, it might be a little bit more like this. We have an anomaly. Its peak is located at 25 meters along the profile, and so you're uh, diagnostic positions are going to be measured, uh, the distances are going to be measured relative to this reference point. Uh, a reference point of zero associated with the location of the peak along the profile there. So, so those are a couple adjustments that you would have to make. Again, uh, take a shot at this, take a screen capture, uh, print it out, give it a try. So if you did, uh, this is uh, this is an example of the way you might set it up. Uh, I've got the diagnostic positions for the anomaly on the left here. And so we ju we're just measuring off for this anomaly. It, whether it's a sphere, whether it's a cylinder, uh, the diagnostic positions are not going to change. This is just the distance from the peak out to a point where the anomaly falls off to three quarters of its maximum value, one half, and one-third of its maximum value. And I haven't uh, written in the uh, diagnostic positions for two-thirds. and one. I'm just taking my own advice here and just using three diagnostic positions. Um, and, you know, if we do that, assuming that this anomaly is produced by a sphere, then we get these estimates for z, and the range in these estimates is 0.28. Um, Assuming that it's a cylinder, we get these estimates of z. Notice that z is a little bit smaller. It's probably about 7.7 .7 or so on average. And that the range in estimates is 0.8. So the anomaly on the left, uh, the range in the estimates of z are less, assuming a sphere than they are assuming a cylinder. So we would conclude then that the anomaly that we see here is most likely produced at something closer in shape to a equidimensionally shaped uh, or a spherically shaped object. Over on the right, uh, same analysis. Uh, we do have different diagnostic positions and again these are all referenced to a zero at 25 meters. So. Uh, the anomaly falls off to three quarters of its maximum value at 5.85 meters away from this symmetry point here at 25 meters. Falls to one half of its maximum value at 9.85 meters and to one third at 14.2 meters. And um, so you have to keep that in mind when you're doing the analysis and when we assume that this anomaly is produced, we use the depth index multipliers associated assuming that it's a sphere, that the anomaly is produced by a sphere, we see that the estimates give us uh, something on average around uh, 13 meters in depth with a delta z or a range of one milligal. If we assume that it's a horizontal cylinder, uh, the range of estimates is uh, about a quarter what they are assuming a sphere. So we, so once again, we're going to assume that uh, the geological feature producing this anomaly is closer in shape to a horizontal cylinder than to a vertical, than to a, uh, uh, a spherically shaped object. So we would conclude in this case that the anomaly is uh, uh, is associated with a source that has a cylindrical shape. So uh, you know just we separated these anomalies out, so, but if we kind of bring them together at the same point and compare them, we can see that the cylinder drops off more gradually than the sphere. 
you know, somebody that's used to looking at data would say, eh, this one's dropping off a little bit less uh, rapidly than this one. This is probably the more compact object. This one is more extended in, <clears throat> in shape. And, you know, of course, you'll notice that for the, the, the sphere, the depth of, well, x, x one half in this case is, you know, about, oh, 7.5. And we have to multiply that by 1.305 in order to get 10. In the case of the cylinder, the cylinder falls off to one half of its maximum value at a distance of 10 meters from the symmetry point. <clears throat> and the depth index multiplier is 1. So, so the depth index multipliers also give you some indication of the drop-off rate uh, for these uh, uh, different, uh, uh, different shapes. So, the sphere is the most compact form that you can get, you know, converging to a point. Uh, the cylinder in two dimensions would be the most compact form that you could get, converging to a, a pencil uh, uh, or a line. And uh, but uh, in you know in three dimensions or in two dimensions, this sphere is going to be dropping off in all directions. The cylinder only along that direction normal to the axis. So that's the process that one can go through in order to, to, to um, uh, kind of evaluate the, evaluate the anomalies that one has to determine, you know, out of possible geometries and you aren't sure which is which, uh, how you might be able to discriminate a little bit more quantitatively between uh, the anomalies that you see, uh, the sources for the anomalies that you see. And that's... Um, a point that we wanted to spend a little bit of time on, and then next time we will talk about the um, uh, vertical uh, cylinder and uh, you know a couple more objects, and then kind of wrap up uh, simple geometrical objects. So, see you next time.